It's great to be here and seeing places in the world that I would not have otherwise seen and uh, to meet the Swedish people and see your beautiful cities here uh, has been lovely. Um, so I just would like to start by telling you who I am and how I came to be doing what I'm doing today because many of you may not know that and I think it's important to understand where I came from. Um, because I think it uh, will give you a, a better picture of the validity of what I'm saying. And uh, I realize that I'm speaking English and that is not everybody's native language. So if there's a word or something that needs to be translated, you can just raise your hand and somebody will translate. I'm speaking much slower than I usually do and much more clearly. <laughs> and um, so hopefully that will help. Um, and maybe we could keep questions to the end so that we can keep this moving smoothly. First off, um, I will tell you that I lost my glasses and I wonder where I could have put them. Oh, here they are. Uh, I started out um, uh, in college, in university, and I got a bachelor's degree in physics. And then I worked in a laboratory for several years. And in that time, I decided that I wanted to uh, work with people and not rats and uh, dead cow brains and things like that that I was working with. So I went to medical school and, um, and had one of the happiest days of my life. The day I graduated was felt like a big accomplishment. And then I moved on to my residency in New York City. And during that period, I realized um, something that I did not realize before I went to medical school, which is that what I had really become was a highly um, trained technician for the pharmaceutical industry. And this was um, saddening to me because my original intention was to go and be able to heal people and cure their diseases and bring them to higher levels of health. And I didn't learn to do that in medical school. I learned to do that later in the past few years. Now, I don't have anything completely against the pharmaceutical industry because I have witnessed the miracles of giving a drug to somebody who needs it when they need it. It's fantastic if you want to get rid of a symptom, pain, if you have organ failure, we need this kind of medicine. The problem is that when people have minor issues, health issues, that this kind of medicine is used automatically as first line of defense and none of these drugs from pharmaceutical industry bring people to higher states of natural health. Whereas there are many uh, nutraceuticals and nutritional advice that can be given to people that can do that, and then they can avoid these drugs. And that's really my belief at this point in how I practice medicine, but that wasn't always the case. So during my residency, when I realized this problem, I decided that instead of doing things to people that were healthy that I did not necessarily agree with, like sending them for mammograms and vaccinating them and all of the things that we do to healthy people in the narrow uh, corridor that I was allowed to work within the conventional medical system, I thought, well, let me take what I've learned and try to just use it on really sick people. So I specialized in kidneys. And so that took five more years uh, beyond medical school to do all of that. And I worked for approximately 14 years in, um, in, in doing nephrology, which is practicing with, um, mostly with kidneys and high blood pressure and diabetes and things like that, some metabolic diseases. And I taught medical students, I taught residents, and I taught doctors in that period of time. I worked in academia. I have a couple of papers published in peer-reviewed journals, and uh, it was around 2009 that, um, that there was something that uh, did not feel right to me, and that was when uh, several people came in to the hospital having new onset kidney failure after they had been vaccinated uh, for the swine flu, and that year, in USA, we had separate vaccine, one for swine flu, one for seasonal flu. And um, for whatever reason, 
I know you folks had problem with that vaccine as well, but we had a different problem as far as I'm concerned. And that was um, people told me that they were fine until they had that vaccine. And then all of a sudden they had had normal kidney function and all of a sudden they now needed dialysis. And several people this happened with. And I, um, I thought, well, this is a problem that we need to investigate because any drug that causes kidney failure, we would stop and we would discuss it. But when it came to vaccination, the response I got from my colleagues and coworkers was very different. And uh, so I brought this problem to the administration and they told me that, um, that it, they, these patients did not have kidney failure from the flu shot and that they had flu and that's why they had kidney failure. But these patients had no flu symptoms. So they, were, um, they had no basis to say what they were saying to me. And after that, I started, to, um, I started to ask questions when new patients would come to me, either with new problems or with worsening of old problems. And this is a question that every doctor needs to add to their list of questions, which is, when was your last vaccine? Because often you will make a correlation between a new symptom and a vaccine, and often you will find numerous case reports in the peer-reviewed medical literature that can support the potential for the vaccine to cause this problem. So once I did that, I saw that there was a correlation and oftentimes I would see within 24 hours of a vaccine, for instance, a patient in the hospital would come in with borderline normal kidney function, get a vaccine and kidney function would go down within 24 hours and the vaccine was still denied as the cause. Our hospital was vaccinating people who, I remember I walked into a room and there was a young man who had cancer, uh, some sort of lymphoma, and he was on chemotherapy. And the pharmacist had just come in to offer him a flu shot and a pneumonia shot, and he had consented to say okay, and they were about to give it. And I canceled that order and realized later that in our hospital, Somebody could, the, the policy was that my patients could be vaccinated under my name for the order, even though I didn't order it. That was the policy to offer every patient that was conscious, no matter what their disease, these vaccines. And so I think that should stand out to everybody as problematic. Now, would you want to give a, a, a flu shot and a pneumococcal vaccine to a man who has cancer and is on chemotherapy right that moment? That seems very logical to me to just say, no, you wouldn't do that. I saw vaccines being given to people who are having heart attacks while they were having the heart attacks, uh, while they had active sepsis, while they had new onset kidney problems um, and numerous other ailments that there was no scientific literature to support vaccinating. But the ethos was vaccines are safe and effective and they need to be given. Well, I started doing research at that point, and what I found was very much counter to, um, to tradition and to what I had been told in medical school. You may not know this, but doctors are not taught about vaccines in medical school. We are not taught what's in vaccines as far as the adjuvants. We are not taught how vaccines are manufactured as far as what kind of animals uh, go into them. We are not taught the potential dangers of vaccination, and we are basically given a piece of paper that says when the vaccines are due and to give them. And I found this to be very alarming, and even more so when I researched the history of smallpox and the history of polio, two diseases that I was continuously told were eradicated by vaccination. My research that I wrote in a book with Roman Bistrionic uh, was completely counter to that. And in fact, populations who stopped vaccinating for smallpox, their smallpox diseases declined and deaths from smallpox declined. And with the polio vaccine, the story is so complicated, um, but basically just saying that I today do not believe that the injected polio vaccine is the reason why we saw polio go away. It does not make polio go away at all. It can still be passed around through populations. And the polio is not what I once thought it was. So 
given all that, I decided to leave my conventional job and uh, re do research. And today, I study between six and 12 hours every day, seven days per week, learning immunology, history, um, toxicology, uh, genetics, and all kinds of things that one must understand in order to know uh, the deeper details of the problems with vaccination. So what I'm going to tell you today is largely based on my research and on peer-reviewed literature. You will see on many of my slides, there will be a number called PMID, and you can go and look up these articles that I will be uh, showing you by going to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D.com and put that number in, and these articles will come up. Many of them you will get full text, and some of them you'll get just the abstract. Um, and I think that it is important for you to hear both sides. Now, I'm well aware that the medical authorities uh, use fear in order to get uh, populations to vaccinate. I have evidence of that, uh, which I can show you. I'm also well aware that they do not think that you should be educated and informed, but the authorities tell doctors to persuade you and to use fear if necessary, and to kick you out of their office if you will not vaccinate. And these are the kind of tactics and techniques that are used to get people to vaccinate themselves and their babies. And I don't think this is fair. I think that you are all intelligent enough to look at both sides and decide for yourself, should I vaccinate my baby? Should I vaccinate myself? Should I recommend vaccines to my mother and father? Um, and it's a big problem when people are told not to look at the other side. And what you might notice, if, if you've been in the middle of this problem yourself, is that the people who want to vaccinate um, are often very aggressive, and they don't want you to hear the other side. And that should make a light bulb in your head go off. Why don't they want me to hear the other side? Why don't they think I can actually listen to both and come up with my own decision? See, I will never tell you not to vaccinate, but they will always tell you to vaccinate for everything. That alone, I believe, should be a red flag to you, that I'm saying you listen to everything and then you choose. What you do is your responsibility. And that's not what the, what the, what the people who are supporting this aggressive vaccination campaigns, more and more vaccines all the time to little babies. That's not what they're saying. So tonight, I have many things I could talk to you about. I have many things that I prepared, um, but uh, usually when I travel, there's always a question that comes back again and again. And last year was tetanus. A lot of people wanted to know about tetanus because polio and tetanus happen to be two diseases that people believe, even if they don't believe in all vaccines, that they believe that they may want to still vaccinate for these as I did. Now, also, I want you to know that... I just, just want to make sure that everyone knows what tetanus is. It's yeah, the no. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I used to believe in vaccines. I used to give vaccines, okay? So it's not like I always had this, um, this problem against the vaccines. I was vaccinated before medical school. Um, I was vaccinated as a child, but I was not vaccinated to the, the degree that babies are vaccinated today. And there were nowhere near as many vaccines then. So in my research, I used to, in the beginning of my research, I thought, well, there still must be some vaccines that I would take. But now there are no vaccines that I would take, okay? That's just for me. I don't care if I'm going to Sri Lanka or Africa, there's no vaccine that I would take after doing my research because I'm willing to accept responsibility for the outcome of whether I do vaccinate or whether I don't vaccinate. And because I have researched how to keep myself healthy, how to keep my immune system working even if I'm faced with Ebola virus, okay? So I don't have any fear of dying from infection because I've done my research and you are all capable of doing that. In fact, most parents have developed a level of understanding of the immune system and health and vaccination far above what their doctors know. And that's my belief is that is why the health authorities tell doctors not to talk to you 
because they know that most doctors will lose the argument unless they have taken the time to really understand. And most doctors don't have the time to take that I have. And, and they don't have the time to, to sit and research both sides. So they have to, by default, listen to the authorities and do as they're told. So I'm not saying doctors are bad people. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm saying that doctors are not informed and they're too busy to get informed. So it's your job to get informed because you are the best line of defense for your children, okay? So if you'd like, I can start by um, a tetanus presentation and we can do that during the first hour. And then I have more information on um, history, on uh, influenza, on vitamin C, infant immunity. Um, so we can talk about other topics. And then the last hour, maybe we just do question and answer. Does that sound good? Okay. Before I get into that, I just want to show you a few interesting things. And this is from a, a little magazine that is very highly read in America. It's very popular called Reader's Digest. And Kathleen Sebelius is our Secretary of Health and Human Services, a very high level position in government. And she said um, that there are groups out there, like me, uh, who um, say that vaccines are responsible for problems. And they say that um, we have reached out to the media to try to get the media not to give me uh, my view uh, or equal weight, uh, because she says the science has already shown the safety and effectiveness of vaccination, so my voice should not be heard. Um, I couldn't disagree with that more, um, because the more science I know, the more indignant and upset I get, because I know that the science shows major problems with the theory of vaccination and with the practice of vaccination. Uh, this, is a, this is a PowerPoint presentation that comes from Mayo Clinic. This is a, a very prestigious institution in USA, and this is one of our leading vaccine promoters in USA. And he made a PowerPoint presentation to give to all doctors uh, to help them talk to people who don't want to vaccinate. And I just took out a couple of slides to show you. It was a very long presentation, but he basically is coaching these doctors um, how to deal with you. Um, uh, one of the pro oh, here's one of the major problems is that uh, uh, this fellow, and this is common, okay, the pro-vaccine world is rife with conflict of interest. These doctors that are promoting vaccines, by and large, have some sort of interest in the vaccine uh, being uptake, taken up by the public. So here's just a little list of his uh, conflict of interest. There are numerous conflict of interest of this gentleman, and they're listed in many of his papers because they have to list them. Uh, they say, don't plan on giving you any printed information. Don't plan on emailing you any links to information. Does that seem a little strange? They're saying not to give you the information. They said, instead, read and remember. Well, that's not happening. I can guarantee you that. This, I think, is the worst, most egregious statement here, which is he's telling them to persuade you rather to than inform you. Okay, so you know now. This is... Um, this was, this was a PowerPoint presentation to doctors. This here is from Dr. Lance Rodewald uh, from the Division of Immunization Services Center for Disease Control. He was quoted in the New York Times in 2004, and you can read right there, frightening parents about the consequences of failing to vaccinate their children will most likely be part of the campaign. For the task, meningococcal meningitis is ideal. And, uh, Frightening you is um, key to getting you to do what is, they want you to do. And uh, let me just show you something that happened in New Zealand. Speaking of fear, uh, we had a, a vaccine there called meningococcal B, and this was the uh, informed consent. Okay, right. Give your consent. People holding pen on the other side had a baby that was dying from uh, some sort of uh, hemorrhagic disease. Uh, but the, one of the authorities said that protection is expected to last for a few years, but the exact period is unknown. So many of these babies were given three and four vaccines that had huge amounts of uh, aluminum in them. And uh, later on, we found out that there were even more problems with this vaccine. Uh, 
that they will used a lot of fear to get the public to take up. Um, in four years, 109 cases of the epidemic that they were trying to cover um, were reported, and they were all people who were vaccinated. 60 were partially vaccinated and 49 were fully vaccinated. Parents were lied to about this vaccine, and um, there in the um, in these studies that showed how long the vaccine lasted, they found that the antibody that was made went away very rapidly, somewhere between two and seven months after all three of those doses. Not only that, but they found that you could be vaccinated for this. Most, okay, anyone who was vaccinated for this still carry the bacteria. It didn't get rid of the bacteria, okay? Um, and so these doctors, here's another New Zealand Herald saying, um, that it provided only short-term protection and this doctor said parents should have been told more clearly about this. So this is the problem with being scared into doing something before you understand what's happening. This was an expensive lesson for New Zealand. Um, nowhere in the consent uh, did it mention that immunity dropped below protective levels within two months and the failure to inform parents at the time was disgraceful, according to uh, writings in public in the New Zealand Herald. $200 million were put into this campaign, um, and after that, officials were determined to conceal anything uh, that might cause unease, and everybody was just hush-hush about it. Well, I'd like to show you something else, and that is the data showed from 2006, 2007, 2008, there were 12 deaths of, from this uh, particular bacteria, and every one of them was in a vaccinated child. Not a single one was in an unvaccinated child. Okay? Uh, so here we have the meningitis was coming down. Here's where they started vaccinating, and here we see what the death rate did after they began to vaccinate. This is what can happen when a population is frightened with pictures like this, uh, thinking of your baby being that baby. We saw this happen in the 1950s with polio, and it will continue to happen. I guarantee you we will soon be seeing people dying of Ebola uh, and pictures of them, whether it's Ebola or not, and we will be offered this vaccine. So we have to be very cautious when um, fear is used in a campaign because the, the result is that we stop thinking. So we must always continue to think even in the presence of fear keep our minds open, read as much as you can, and continue to stay healthy, which is always the key to decreasing disease rates. And when I say to stay healthy, I mean nutritionally. I mean make, paying attention to what we're eating, paying attention that we have the right nutrients, that we're not eating lots of food that has no nutrient value that we're not scared all the time because fear, guess what fear does? It raises your cortisol levels and makes your immune system not function properly. Okay, so now on to tetanus because I wanted to talk about fear because this has long been the picture that is used to show you why you need to vaccinate your baby. This is untreated tetanus from 100, maybe 150 years ago. Uh, tetanus is a terrible disease. Uh, we don't want it to happen to anybody, but what I'd like to show you today is how the idea that the vaccine is what, uh, why we don't see very much of it, and that the vaccine is safe and effective, uh, that none of those things is actually in, uh, borne out in reality when we look at the science and the history. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the disease, because um, the, it, it comes from a bacteria, it's a, special, it's a special kind of bacteria, and this is what it looks like when it's in the soil. And it lives in the intestines of um, ruminant animals, uh, like cows and horses, and uh, it comes out in the stool. So back in the old days when we were riding horses through the streets, you can imagine there was a lot of this, uh, much more of it around. So this tennis racket shaped bacteria is totally harmless. You can eat this, you can get it into your wounds and it will not cause any disease so long as it has oxygen. Once you deprive this of oxygen, this occurs, it shape shifts. This is a close up, a really nasty little thing with all these flagella and it can move around. And some, but not all of the strains will produce a toxin, okay? And it's called tetanospasmin. 
And that, in very small doses, is highly toxic and can be lethal to the nervous system. And that's the basis of tetanus. So we know that you can have tons of this in your wound, and if you properly treat the wound and leave it, and air can get to it and no abscess forms, and you continue to disinfect, that you will not develop tetanus, okay? So it's very key for a wound to heal from inside out. You don't want a wound to start to seal over on the outside before the inside is healed properly because anything that's trapped under the skin will fester, there won't be enough air, and this susceptibility can happen. Uh, so I already told you uh, where tetanus is most found, um, but we can also find it just about everywhere else in smaller concentrations. Uh, we find it in houses. We find it also in the past in some sterile cotton dressings from hospitals. Um, five to 40% of the population carries tetanus in their stool and is not sick from it. Um, the disease mostly happens in moist, warm climates uh, near the equator in undeveloped countries where there's livestock. Um, this Dr. Holmes in 1940 wrote the textbook on um, these kinds of diseases. And what he said, something interesting that I highlighted, is that um, tetanus is not primarily a war disease, but it's a disease that claimed, claimed the greatest number of victims among women and children. Yet we also we see this, this man lying naked, you know, in tetanospasm. Spasm. Um, that's the image we always see, but the truth is it was women and children. And sadly, the medical system was often the source of the infection. Um, if you look at this paper from 1937, uh, this doctor outlines that vaccination was often the preceding event before tetanus, circumcision, medical dressings and sanitary towels, abortions, hysterectomies, and childbirth itself because if you uh, know history, and I, we wrote about this in our book, that puerperal fever claimed thousands upon thousands of women, and it was completely avoidable if doctors had only washed their hands between going to the morgue and going to deliver babies. And there were doctors that were telling, um, there were two doctors in particular, uh, one in Austria and one in USA, saying, please wash your hands with this special soap because we can get the, the, this problem down to almost zero. And they were laughed at and ridiculed. And both of them ended up leaving medicine. But later, we found out that they were right. And all of these mothers could have survived, their babies would have survived. And the, 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 the reverberation, uh, the after effect of these mothers dying was huge upon society because there were all these babies and children left without mothers, which increases disease rates, increases death rates. Okay, so let's look back at a little bit of history. This comes from uh, Dr. Nelson, uh, infectious disease book from 2005, and this comes out, out of uh, uh, a big uh, institution in the United States. Um, and in this textbook, we have uh, a quote that says that the decline in mortality from infectious diseases during the 20th century stands as a tribute to advances in public health and safer lifestyles compared with that in previous centuries. And that's really what our book shows, is that these changes in society and lifestyles and improvements in nutrition had more to do with the decline in death and in many cases with incidence of diseases than anything else, including antibiotic invention, including vaccination. As proof, I'd like to show you some infectious diseases. This is the year 1900, this is the year 1935, and this is the year 1970. Let's look at how the death rate went down for these diseases. Influenza and pneumonia claimed 202 per 100,000 in 1900 in the United States. In 1935, before there was any vaccine whatsoever, we were down by half. And by 1970, before the vaccination programs were really up, uh, up and running, we we're down even further. The original vaccines for influenza in USA, if you um, look at the writing of a doctor named Dr. Anthony Morris, who worked at the uh, Division of Biologic uh, Sciences, which is now the National Institu Institutes of Health. His job was to determine the safety of these vaccines. 
And he determined not only were they not safe in the 1970s, but they were no more effective than tap water. And he testified to the, this uh, effect uh, in front of uh, the Senate, and um, he was a, a definitely a qualified person to make that statement. Today, we are still offered these vaccines for influenza despite, um, the, despite uh, any real support for their effectiveness, despite any well-designed studies for their safety, and despite the fact that the most prestigious um, uh, collaboration called the Cochrane Collaboration, who evaluates uh, different aspects of medicine, is saying that the hype and the media uh, information on influenza is completely out of proportion to the science. Okay, so let's look now at measles. We had 31 per 100,000 deaths in 1900, down to 2.7 long before the measles vaccine came in. And uh, I'll show you in a minute that it was almost down to zero right before the vaccine came on the scene. Okay, so I always thought the tetanus was uh, much more uh, prevalent than it actually was, but it turns out that, look, it, you don't even find tetanus on most charts like this because it was such a low incidence disease. So we had four per 100,000 back in the time when all these other things were claiming people's lives. And then by 1935, before tetanus vaccines, we had 0.95. Um, so let's move on here, and I'm going to show you some more graphs in a minute. Uh, but I also want to show you a quote from uh, this article from 1980. And this doctor says that the death rate from tuberculosis, diphtheria, scarlet fever, all these other things, uh, started to fall long before the introduction of vaccinations or antibiotics. And that's exactly what Roman and I found when we did our research looking at vital statistics in parts of the world where they were available from the mid-1800s and onwards. Uh, this, is a, this is another chart from our book, and it shows you um, the death rate in England and Wales from various diseases. Now, you can take pictures if you like. I'm happy for you to take pictures, but I'll tell you that if you go to dissolvingillusions.com, you can actually see all of the graphs that are in the book in color for free. You can also read the author's introduction, and you can, um, uh, you can read, I think it's the first page of every chapter. So let's look at measles. Okay, measles is the green line. And you can see the death rate for measles was uh, quite high, you know, around 40 per 100,000. And then it started to decline around the time when food was improving, child labor laws were being instated, um, and when uh, plumbers came on the scene and the sewage was separated from the drinking water. And look, here's when the measles vaccine came. Interesting, isn't it? It was almost down to zero. We have the exact numbers, but it's like 0 0.3 or something like that. Um, okay, here we have scarlet fever. Now, scarlet fever vaccines were developed, um, but they found that they really only gave them to healthcare workers sporadically, and that um, there were so many problems uh, with, with these uh, vaccines, al allergic reactions, that they never really used them in mass production. But here we see a disease that, so we can say they really never vaccinated the masses for scarlet fever. But look, death rate for scarlet fever. And it was down here, a lot of people say, well, that's because we have antibiotics, Dr. Humphreys. But antibiotics were created here, down here, around the 19, there were some not so great antibiotics in the late 1930s, 19, late 1940s, as, and the early 1950s is when penicillin came, but you can see the death rate was down uh, because the people were stronger. And that's really important, that the people being strong is much more important than the, the, than the microbe being strong. Do you know that bubonic plague that used to take a quarter of the population and wiped out masses in Europe, do you know we still have that in USA? You don't hear about it because not a lot of people are dying from it. Okay. Here we have uh, whooping cough, and again, you see the same thing. Here's when whooping cough vaccine came in. So it's just silly to say that vaccination is responsible for the decline in death rate. Okay, so let's get back to tetanus because we're often told that, um, you know, once we gave this vaccine, we saw this enormous drop in death and cases, and we're shown this graph here. 
And it really does look like, you know, the tetanus vaccine came in around here and look, we have this ski slope coming down. But the problem is, and this is, the, this is how you'll be shown uh, by the public health authorities, all the vaccines success. Uh, they don't show you the whole graph. Here's what happens when you look at the whole graph. Uh, we can see that it was already coming down and then it came down further. But look at how much more dramatic it was in England and Wales. And we can see that the, the decline in, in incidence of mortality is here and the vaccine came in here. And we actually see it come up a little bit um, after the vaccine came in. And this is the same thing uh, in Canada. You know, we see that uh, the death rate from tetanus, they only started reporting cases here, but we can see the death rate was, was just precipitously falling. And this is the year the vaccines came in. And again, we see for some strange reason an increase right there, but we can't say that we, we have tetanus vaccines to thank because the, the trend was already seriously coming down. Um, I keep saying it's about the people, it's about the people, it's not about the microbe. Um, there are some, some situations where the people, their immune systems uh, and their blood flow isn't so good and so they can become more susceptible. So diabetics we know are much more susceptible than non-diabetics. They don't have a, the, the best blood flow to the skin and that's part of the problem is that you need to keep oxygen coming into a wound to prevent tetanus. Uh, they have high sugar rates in the blood and that also feeds bacteria and they tend to have higher inflammation and lower vitamin C levels. Drug injectors, it's the same thing. Uh, they're just chronically ill, they're much more susceptible, and they're putting dirty needles into their skin, which doesn't help very much. Uh, the diagnosis is basically one made by looking at a patient. We don't have any tests to show that we, uh, that we can make this uh, just by testing. Uh, we, we know that only 40% of all cases are ever reported in USA, and so um, I also know personally of uh, two, three cases that uh, the parents insisted were tetanus, that the clinical scenario was completely consistent with tetanus, but the doctors would not uh, report it as tetanus because the patients were vaccinated. And this is something that happens after vaccines. We see it happen after the pertussis vaccine. We wrote about that. Um, things change, the diagnose, diagnostic um, criteria often change after a vaccine is introduced so that less cases get reported just because of that. But there's also bias not to report the vaccinated or even to think that the vaccinated have the disease. And this is, this is also written about in many medical journals that we're missing tetanus cases uh, because we don't think of it because of the vaccine. Well, because I've been to Finland twice and because they first asked me for this, I looked up their, um, their history of tetanus. And since they're your neighbors, I think that's fair enough to show you. So uh, let's look at this article from 1993. Is that me making like, ba is that background noise in the speakers? No, okay, tell me if you hear, I feel like I'm hearing something. Um, so there were 106 cases of tetanus between 1969 and 1985. Five of them were children. Four of them had received adequate vaccination against tetanus. So the point I'm making now is that this vaccine has never been and still is not anywhere close to a guarantee that your child will not develop tetanus. You have to do other things to uh, work towards your child not getting tetanus. We hear, okay, another thing I wanna tell you about is that you will be told the statistics on death rates uh, for instance, you'll be told how many children die every year of measles, and you'll be told that's why you need to get a measles vaccine. But what they won't tell you is that those deaths by and large are in Africa and countries where people are starving. The same goes with, with uh, tetanus, is that we're, he we're told about all these deaths that are happening every year still from tetanus, but they're not here, and they're certainly not in babies. Uh, in, in Finland, the last case of baby tetanus was in 1915, and they did not start vaccinating babies until 1957. So after doing my research, it's my determination that there's no reason to give an infant a tetanus vaccine. Uh, even even if, they, if they worked, it's not necessary. Babies are not, um, you know, the reason babies used to get this is because people didn't understand how to use uh, sterility techniques and the, and the cord. 
And so they were putting mud on it, or they weren't using proper surroundings, or the wrong dressings that had uh, bacteria in them. So this isn't happening anymore. Um, well, this slide is just showing you a study that shows that um, the difference between the vaccinated and the not vaccinated as far as antibody isn't that great, is that some of these uh, unvaccinated children still have high antibody levels and the vaccinated, uh, you know, similar to the vaccinated. So the, we can't just go by antibody levels because it does not very well correlate to the um, level of protection. And you can see the death rate in the non-vaccinated was 42.9 and in the vaccinated was 50%. So it's a little, always a little more complicated than they, they like to simplify things for you. Um, okay, so we're often told about herd immunity. And uh, you might be familiar with that term. Are you familiar? Okay, so that's basically saying that you're irresponsible if you don't vaccinate yourself or your child because you're putting other people at risk. Well, there's a few problems with that theory. One is that if people trust their vaccines, they shouldn't be worried about what you're doing. But even more problematic to me is the more I understand about vaccines, the more I understand that so many of the people that are vaccinated are actually developing the disease and then infecting other people, oftentimes shortly after they're vaccinated. You know, I used to think this didn't happen, but just recently I came across an article about cases in Croatia where these children were vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, and about a week after the vaccination, they developed measles and infected other people. And the article said, that in the past, they would have never made the link that it was vaccine strain causing the infections because they would have either called it another disease because the child was vaccinated or they would have thought it was a wild, vac uh, it was a wild uh, uh, virus, not from the vaccine. But now that we have the ability to test, is it vaccine strain or is it wild? We're seeing that these vaccines can and do infect after these people are vaccinated. We know it happens with rotavirus, the swallowed uh, virus uh, that are given to infants, and we know that it happens with oral polio vaccines. We know it happens with measles, and we always we've known it's happened with rubella. So when people want to use this herd immunity uh, argument, it's really not very rational. And this concept of herd immunity really came from a time when people were not vaccinating. There was a doctor who looked at the populations and he noticed that uh, when 95% of the population of children below 15 had had measles, that epidemics were at a very low rate. And when that changed, when that dropped, then they would see some outbreaks. But it wasn't that people were dying left, right, and center, because as we know, the death rate went down not as a result of, of, uh, of vaccination. So this concept of herd immunity does really not apply to vaccination for several reasons. One, I already told you the vaccines can spread disease, but two, because if we just take measles, for instance, anybody here over the age of 70? Uh, did you have measles growing up? Yes. And how was that for you? Well, uh, I had measles. Uh, I, 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 I read the notes my mother made at that time. Okay. And she wrote, and he had measles, and she wasn't, she wasn't too bad. And I called my, and she called her friend to bring her daughter to me. <laughs> so she couldn't catch measles as well. That's what mothers did at that time. Measles parties. Yeah. Because they wanted to get it over with. Yeah. My, my mother's friend was a nurse, a yeah. very, very talented nurse, and she brought um, her liver on. Thank you. I did not plant her in the audience. I want everybody to know that. <laughs> But I know that there's always somebody over 70 in my audience, and they always say that same thing. Did you know anybody that went blind from measles? Did anybody you know went blind from measles? Did you know of anybody who died from measles? OK. All right, we're so far 100% on that, these questions. Cod liver oil has vitamin A. 
And it's been known about since the 1940s that that is key to recovery from measles because for whatever reason, the measles virus makes the body consume enormous amounts of vitamin A. Um, and without that, that's when you get this problem with the eyes. And the medical authorities used to say, what did they tell you? Just keep you in a dark room. But that's no cure for, for blindness or for photophobia. You have to treat the disease, not just put them in a dark room. So the vitamin A was very important. And today we now know that 400,000 units a day to someone who has measles makes a huge difference in the recovery time and in the rate of secondary infections. The other thing is that people were wanting their children to be infected with measles uh, because they wanted to get it over with. Uh, it was a mild disease of limited duration. Our health authorities knew that and wrote about that before the vaccine was invented. But today, young people, I mean, what if, can you imagine having your, your one-year-old infected with measles? Doesn't that just make you feel horror? Now, why would that be? It's because of what you've heard and what you've read. Because after a vaccine is invented, there, t there tends to be lots of reports of the bad things that can happen, like chicken pox, which anyone my age would have had chicken pox. But we're told in America that, um, that this is a da very dangerous disease and people are dying of secondary staph infections. But problem is, is that doctors often give antibiotics and fever reducers to these um, problems, and that makes everything worse. Uh, I had another thought before I get to your question. Um, which is that you had measles, you have 75 years worth of immunity. I was vaccinated. I probably don't have immunity to measles right now. So I uh, am potentially more of a threat to the herd than you are, okay? My babies would not be getting the advantage of my immunity. So my babies are more not only a threat to the herd immunity, but they are threatened by my lack of immunity. Your babies got much more immunity from your placenta, from your milk, and uh, so they were protected by you and by real herd immunity. Now, as people your age are dying, older than you, of course, um, are dying, um, we're losing the true herd, and we're being replaced by these false herd, and um, so they're telling us now that we need to revaccinate. But for tetanus, this can't happen, and that's because we will never get rid of the spores in the environment, and I cannot give you tetanus, so it's not contagious from person to person. What was your question? No, not a question. No, it was a lady back there. I just wanted uh, to ask, uh, I had the measles when I was a child, and it went very well, but then I, I came to hospital for something different later, and uh, I shared a room with a girl who was 17 and she, she had brain damage and they said that was from the, from the measles. Uh -huh. I just wanted to... Yeah, well, see measles has to be treated properly. That's part of the problem is that, um, first of all, I would say how many vaccines did that child have beforehand? I would say, did she get breastfed? I'd want to know that because that's a huge deal when it comes to the development of our immunity. Breastfeeding not only helps the baby develop their immunity, but it makes you stronger even as an adult, okay? So, and I would want to know, did those doctors give that girl antibiotics when she had measles? Which will uh, basically disrupt the real immunity in the bowel because it napalms the bowel. And I would want to know um, if she got vitamin A and vitamin C. Now those are things that I would ask of that person before I would automatically say that it was all because of a virus. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna just keep going now because we can do the questions at the end. Uh, okay, let's talk a little about the vaccine. Um, I'm gonna skip over a lot of these because I have about 150 slides. Um, okay, so I will tell you that I have a stack of medical literature papers of case reports of fully vaccinated people with very high antibody levels, or even just normal antibody levels, who developed tetanus disease, uh, some of the worst kind of tetanus disease. So why could that happen? Well, I put this little picture in to show you, uh, because what, what we have is, uh, this is just an anatomical view, and on the outside, of course, you have skin. And so when that skin uh, can be disrupted uh, or dying pieces of skin, then uh, tetanus, um, 
Tetanus bacteria loves to live in dead flesh. That's its favorite place to live, uh, dead flesh with low oxygen. So uh, if we have that happen, look that we have, see the, all these yellow things are nerves. See the yellow lines coming up and they come up here and they go into the central nervous system and up into the brain. And these red ones are arteries and there should be blue ones in here too, but I guess it's not a complete uh, drawing. But so there's veins and arteries. So everything travels in the same place in the same direction, nerve, artery, vein, lymphatics. They all always go together. So if tetanus, uh, tetanus toxin comes into the body and is generated in the body, and if it gets to the nerve before the blood gets to it, then it doesn't matter how high your antibody levels are. You can still have tetanus go up to the brain and, and either kill you or make you very sick. No, it doesn't matter how many times you've been vaccinated. So that's why wound care is the most important thing when it comes to preventing tetanus. Uh, okay, so where does the vaccine come from? Well, I just told you that tetanus loves to live on dead flesh. And I think it's important before you give a vaccine to your child to learn where they all come from. Because um, it's nothing like what I used to think, and so maybe it's not what you used to think, but I used to think that they just somehow magically got a piece of uh, bacteria or a piece of virus and um, put it in some salt water and injected it into me, and that was it. But in order to make a vaccine, you have to mass produce uh, the virus or the bacteria or whatever microbe makes the toxin, in this case, tetanus bacteria. So they have to find a way to mass produce these, this tetanus bacteria without oxygen. So they basically take a beef heart or a piece of you know, cow meat and they uh, combine it with pancreas from another animal to dissolve it and put these cells on plates and let them grow. Um, they don't have to do it this way anymore, but, but probably everybody in this room uh, who is an adult uh, was vaccinated with this kind of a vaccine. Today they have the ability to make them using soy and using, using non-animal, but they don't necessarily. They still use this technique. So uh, the vaccines are made on rotten meat, uh, heart, and with pancreas juice, and then they also have to keep these cells alive. And you can't keep them alive with vegetable juice, unfortunately. You have to put blood on them. And so they will get cow blood and cow albumin and make special solutions to keep these cells alive while they're making the bacteria that makes the toxin. Then they take the toxin and they have to deactivate it so that it doesn't kill you when they inject you with it. Um, so uh, they do that using formaldehyde uh, and that's how we, we get that. So in the end, what we end up with is uh, uh, traces of, of mercury, mercury still in there, a uh, good dose of aluminum in order to make you respond to the very tiny inactivated toxin and formaldehyde. And you would think that it was just nice and pure and that's all we have, uh, but we don't. What we find from this paper here, even in 2014, is that they're reporting that not only is, it, is there a lot of variability from batch to batch, um, meaning non-homogeneous, but it contains proteins from the culture medium, from the bacteria, and from degradation products. Degradation would mean your rotten meat here. Uh, just very tiny amounts. They'll show you it's all it's just very teeny, teeny, tiny amounts and that we shouldn't worry about that. Um, so moving right along, um, safety, as far as vaccines go, has a specific definition. And that is that we can only say it's safe um, in relation to the condition of you when you're given it. So in other words, um, you could have a, um, a disease that we don't know about, like uh, an immunoglobulin deficiency or a cancer uh, or a mitochondrial disease. Um, and then you get this vaccine and, or genetic disorder say, and then the vaccine can trigger a problem. And then they will blame you because you had this pre-existing condition and not necessarily is it a problem of the vaccine. Um, so this is something you should know about. And also that most of the time uh, at least in the beginning of vaccine trials, that they're tested on healthy people, that 
if you have anemia or you've recently had a blood transfusion or you're on certain medications, they won't take you in a trial for vaccine, but they'll still offer you the vaccine later uh, when, after it comes to market. Uh, we have zero placebo saline controlled safety and efficacy, meaning does it work, trials on humans or primates for tetanus. Uh, the basis of effectiveness for tetanus is based on history. Uh, it's based on the history of disease during wars, which I'm going to talk about next, on guinea pig tests, and on many assumptions. So here's what happened between World War I and World War II. Is, uh, in World War I, uh, there were a report of 70 cases. Uh, I believe this was within... So it's, it's within a specific place. I believe this is United States data, okay? Uh, so we have 70 cases uh, of, of uh, tetanus World War I, 12 cases World War II. Uh, there were 500,000 wounds versus 3 million wounds. And so um, the rates were much higher during World War I than World War II. And we vaccinated our soldiers during World War II a lot. I mean, we vaccinated them when they enlisted. We vaccinated them every year, and we vaccinated them any time they had a wound. So um, the assumption was that it must have been the vaccine that made everything better. So let's take a look at some of the, the data that we can find in uh, prestigious medical journals, peer-reviewed medical journals. This one here in 1946 reported on European and African war campaigns of World War II. Um, and they found that there was uh, 22 cases in the vaccinated, 62 cases in the not vaccinated. But look at the death rate difference. There was an 87% death rate in those that were vaccinated and a 48% death rate in those that were not vaccinated. So again, what are we concerned about? The death rate or disease rate? I think we need to be concerned about both and be asking questions about both. But let's look at this, US Army World War II. There are 12 cases. And this paper shows you each case and how many times and when they were vaccinated. And of those 12 people, seven of them were vaccinated. So why now? Let's go back to our world wars. World War I was fought using horses. The soldiers, the cavalry were a lot on horses. Um, it was fought in areas of the world um, that it was lots of farmland, trenches, and uh, so oftentimes the soldiers were covered in mud and water up to their hips. Medical care was not readily available to them and uh, antibiotics had not yet been invented. Uh, so there was a big difference in, in the stage, as we call it, between these two wars that would have put these soldiers at much higher risk um, to contract the bacteria and at susceptibility for developing disease from it. They're also, uh, you know, imagine the stress of being a soldier under those conditions. So World War II, uh, they say, was a little more gentlemanly uh, fought war uh, in that there was less hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, there were almost, I, I don't know how many horses, but there were nowhere near as many as there were in World War I. You know, we had by then motor cars and tanks and, you know, boats is, is how some of the transportation occurred and soldiers were not put into the same uh, situation that they were in World War I. And we, at this point, had um, more medics on the field and uh, better understanding of wound management. So um, I think we can't make the assumption that it was um, just the vaccine that made this big difference. Okay, I wanna show you something I find interesting and I'll tell you why. First off is that uh, there are two uh, branches of our immune system. Okay, so we don't have vaccines for every disease. We don't die from every disease. So we must have another ability <clears throat> to fight disease than just memory immunity, which is what vaccines are supposed to give you, is memory immunity in your blood. So you have a line of defense in your blood, cellular immunity, called innate immunity. And these are cells and some preformed antibodies, but uh, they're nonspecific, but they're cells that are ready to go on the attack. And um, then there's a branch of immunity called humoral immunity, and that has to do with antibody, which, which having preformed antibody. And um, 
what we find when we look at the response of these two arms of immunity after being vaccinated is that 15 to 18 percent of children do not respond uh, via their cellular immune uh, system and 12 to 14 don't respond via their antibody system and that when we look at all of the non-responders, we find around 39% had a deficiency in one or the other kind of response. I find this really interesting, especially when we think about herd immunity, right? Because we're told that the three or 5% of the population that's not choosing to vac that's choosing to not vaccinate <coughs> is putting the rest of the population at risk. But you can see here that for a disease that does have uh, the potential to spread from person to person, that this group of people that was vaccinated is actually uh, much higher, this group of people is much higher than the non-vaccinated children are. And um, because of the, the diseases like mumps or rubella, for instance, it's very common for children not to respond to the rubella vaccine. And if we have time, I'll show you the paper that talks about that. So it's not just the tetanus vaccines that children are not responding 100% or even close to 100%. We have another paper down here um, that talked about the fact that, you know, 95% of the population is vaccinated, but we're finding um, evidence of what they call protection only in, in, in the mid 80s, 80%. So these people are the um, kind of unknown uh, non-immune but that uh, these people, we don't know that they're not immune, but they actually are not immune. We just assume they're immune. And that if they have a disease that looks like tetanus, they don't think it could be because they say uh, they were vaccinated. So those are the people that don't respond. Now let's look at what can happen in children who do respond. Okay, so um, this study is important because what this scientist did is, is they, uh, okay, I have to give you a little history, which is that there was uh, a period of time uh, recently where children in Africa were vaccinated for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, and the death rate among the vaccinated was much higher uh, for other diseases. And so these doctors said, well, let's look at what happens on a genetic level after we vaccinate a series of children. So today we have the ability to look at these sensitive and sophisticated genetic responses after vaccination. And you know, we're told that vaccines are kind of one size fits all, that we give the same vaccine to everybody and that everybody will have uh, a similar response, at least to, um, for, for hopefully being protected against the target. But what we don't hear is what else happens in the rest of the body after a vaccine. And what we can see here is that each one of these is a different girl. There were eight girls that were vaccinated and they looked to see genetically um, what proteins started to be made because genes make proteins, okay? So after, after any kind of a, an intervention or an ingestion, something like this, we can see certain genes becoming uh, activated. And it was to me quite alarming to see the different uh, activations that happened. And I just, this is an actual chart from the, from the article, but I, I broke down, uh, made it a little simpler so we can read it better. But what we found is that there were what, what I refer to as epigenetic alterations because they didn't, it's not a gene mutation, okay? What it is, it's a gene activation. So while we used to think that our genes are our destiny, we now know that they're not our destiny, that only a small percent of our genes dictates what happens to us. The, our destiny is about what those genes are told to do. And what those genes are told to do has so much to do with what we're exposed to. So we know that, say, smoking, even eating rice can change your uh, epigenetic profile. So any injection is sure to change the epigenetic profile. So what we find here is that after, and it happens by signaling, so think of the cell as a ball and think of the genes on the inside of the ball. On the outside of the ball, there are around 2,000 receptors that, 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 that respond to what's happening in the broth that that cell is bathed in. 
So depending on what's hitting the outside of the cell, be it aluminum or formaldehyde or tetanus toxoid, we will see different signals go into the cell and different instructions will be given to the genes which will make protein. Okay, that's how it works. So we see um, epigenetic alterations resulting in upregulation of genes that are associated with genetic disorders, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disease, immunological disease, connective tissue disorders, developmental disorders. The, the list was very long. And these girls all responded differently to each other. And also, there, um, you know, the, there are things called cytokines, which are chemicals in the blood that, that tell your cells how to respond during an infection. And they found that those cytokines were different in, in, in different girls as well. So there's a huge difference. If I was to vaccinate each one of you, the list of what genes would be upregulated would be different in each of you. So um, it's another thing to consider when taking a vaccine, even if the vaccine works, is that so many other things are being changed. Now, most of us seem to get away with this when we're vaccinated, but we don't have any studies looking at the difference between completely vaccinated versus completely not vaccinated and following out for 20, 30, 40 years. We need that. We could do that, actually, because there's a large portion of unvaccinated children in the United States, but our government does not prioritize or have any desire to uh, do that, such a study. So at this point, we can't say for sure that the vaccines are causing these things, but we have now evidence that they could be, and we can't say that they're not causing them. And we know from toxicology that many of the chemicals that are in there uh, are stirring up the, um, the immune system in ways that are not normal. And I'll get into that more in a bit. Uh, so this is another study that I will show you uh, from 2008. This was a Swedish study. And they looked at infants after their diphtheria, tetanus, acellular pertussis vaccines. Uh, and polio hib. So these were babies uh, and they got their regular vaccines at three and five months. And then they took some of their blood out and they exposed it to uh, the whooping cough toxin, which is basically what's in the vaccine, okay? And then they looked to see what happened 12 hours later in a genetic level. And what this doctor reported was 33 allergy related genes were activated 66 asthma genes were activated, 67 cancer genes were upregulated, and 25 immunological genes were upregulated. Okay, so we're definitely seeing on a genetic level uh, some, some waking up. Now, whether or not if it goes through completely and causes these diseases, no, it doesn't in everybody right then and there. But do we know that unless something comes along and shuts these down, what is the result? We don't know. Uh, the first study I showed you on the African girls, the conclusion is that the immunological explanation for the nonspecific effects, which is what I'm talking about, of vaccines is not known at present. Yes, Time out? I stopped you. You stopped me. You? <laughs> I'm too fast? You're too full of information. Oh. <laughs> and now it's break. Okay, good. And, uh... <laughs> okay, break. Okay.